name is Sarah Bass, and I was here, um, not here, but at Library 21 C in August helping out with this meeting. So I work at Kono. Who here has heard of Kono? You raise your hand. Okay, a couple of you. So Kono is an acronym that stands for Council of Neighbors and Organizations, and we are a nonprofit here in Colorado Springs in serving neighborhoods, empowering neighborhoods in El Paso and Teller counties. There's over 800 neighborhoods in El Paso County, so we're busy, um, and we are here to help facilitate the meeting. We are a neutral third party, so basically we're here to help facilitate, give you the information. This is an education um, session to provide details on this very complicated issue. So thank you for being here. Um, if you want to learn more about Kono, I do have my business cards on the table um, over there. Um, we provide a lot of different education and connection and tools to help you advocate for your neighborhood and have a voice around the table, just like you are here tonight to have a voice. So um, I'm just going to run through the agenda and kind of the expectations for tonight so that we're all on the same page. So what we're going to do tonight is um, we have Eric and Commissioner, um, I'm sorry, Councilman, <coughs> Councilman Geis, my here. It's been a long day. I started out on a bike and it was really cold. So I'm still deep on, I think. Um, thank you, Carlos, for riding your bike tonight. Um, but we'll have Eric and um, Councilman Geisinger going through a PowerPoint presentation that's similar to the one that you saw in August, if you were here, to talk about the details of the maintenance district, to talk about the options that you have. No decisions have been made yet, so you're here to get some information and help um, influence the, the road forward. You will see a tentative timeline on um, where things could go as well in the next year. And then I will come up to wrap up the meeting to talk about next steps and how you can get involved um, as a neighborhood. So first, what I'd like to do is go over some ground rules of just how the meeting is gonna go. A lot of times we can get passionate about the place that, um, the place that we live, about our homes, and about money. <laughs> so um, ground rules are everyone participates, no one dominates. So when we get to the Q&A portion of the meeting, we're gonna ask you to raise your hand and I'll come around and get to everybody. Do not interrupt. Uh, we want to hear from everyone that has a question tonight. Keep an own, open mind. Everyone's input matters. So we all have um, different perspectives, so we want to listen to those. And stick to the agenda, the topic at, at hand. Sometimes it's easy to go down into other topics that this might relate to, but we'll really stick with the maintenance district and that scope of work tonight. And then it's okay to disagree, but let's try not to be disagreeable and be respectful. So can we all do a thumbs up if we agree to those ground rules today? Okay, I think I see 100% of thumbs up, I hope so. So I'll keep us on track. I'm, I'm kind of going to be the, the referee tonight um, and make sure we have a good, a good meeting. And again, here to facilitate and um, help you along the way. So I'm going to pass it over. Oh, first, one thing I want to tell you, if you need a restroom, please feel free to get up anytime. Go through these doors and take a left. It's just down the hall. Um, and make sure you signed in, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what your email means later. So first, we're going to hand it over to Eric. Okay. Um, again, my name is uh, Eric Becker. I'm the SIMD administrator for uh, the city of Colorado Springs. I just by a show of hands, how many uh, people were here for the meeting in August? Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through a series of slides and it gives you a little bit of a backdrop to uh, what's going on with with the Briargate SIMD district. I think it's going to be enlightening in terms of giving you some context to things and probably just educational in many ways as well especially if you weren't here for that for that first meeting so all right all right so looking at special districts there's uh, seven of them around uh, Carlos Springs area that I, that I manage um, there's three big ones that uh, I think the real key, Briargate, Norwood, and Stetson are, are the ones that uh, are the largest by far, Briargate being uh, the very largest, about 88 acres of irrigated turf. So what is a special maintenance district? It's created by city ordinance, and there's an advisory board that oversees um, that, that board. We have a couple of the members, uh, in fact, you can go to the next one, there it comes. 
Um, here's the, the board members for um, Briargate. We have uh, Richard DeBose, the chair, who's in the house tonight. He's in the back here, Dick. Kathleen Tillman, who just showed up here. She's on our board. Uh, David Litzelman could not make it tonight. We have uh, Naomi Boswell, who's over here as well. So we've got three of our four board members here. And then we have one vacancy. If you are interested in serving on the board, uh, we do have one, one seat that's open. So. All right, funding mechanism, there's a tax um, assessment, no levy that's um, on your um, property taxes that you've probably noticed. And it's, it's, it's that money goes towards obviously maintenance is a big part of what we're going to be talking about tonight or this evening is, you know, it goes towards the maintenance of streetscapes, rideways, improvement areas, trail corridors, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So here's a sample of a property tax bill. Um, actually, this is uh, Dick's. Uh, talk, no, I'm just kidding. It's not yours. So if you see where I have that red line right there, that's what shows up as the, uh, the portion that pays into the SIMD district. It's roughly about 5% of your property tax, a very small portion. Um, the bill is about 4, or it is 4.409. So, if you look at your property tax bill, you'll see that portion of it designated uh, that goes to the maintenance operations of, of the SIMD. All right, so uh, the ordinance was created in this district um, was in 1983. The revenues for, for this year are $930,000. Okay, that's what the budget was in 2018. Again, the bill is at set of 4.4, so it's actually come down over the year, um, over the years. Um, when the district was initially created, it was at five, so due to Tabor, that number has come down, I think to my knowledge, um, three times. So it's been a 4.4 for, I think, since about uh, 2000, if I remember right. So here's a list of different things that we maintain in the district. Um, most of you are probably aware of those things, again, just, a lot of maintenance operations with um, turf, irrigation, and um, this time of year, snow removal, going tree maintenance, and things like that. Right. So who administers the maintenance of these, um, or the maintenance and management operations? So the Parks Department, the City Parks Department um, maintains these. We have a combination of full-time staff and seasonal staff. We have three full-time staff dedicated, really by 3.6, um, is six. We have a, um, a person that's part-time that kind of goes back and forth between Briargate and Norman and Stetson. We have um, three full-time staff, actually a couple of them are here, just in, interested in knowing what's going on tonight. So um, they're a good resource as well if you want to talk. I just want to point them out. Kevin Dross here over here is the operations supervisor. Um, him and I started about the same time, actually, we're, we're new. We started in March of this year. And then we've got two other folks back here. You just raise your hand that have, that have been uh, a part of the maintenance operations uh, for several years, so. All right, so here's a big part of the reason we're here. This is a, the district, okay? Um, this district, as I mentioned, was created in, in 1983. And it's, it's unlike any other district. This was kind of the, the, the work in progress. This was the one that uh, was the trial run for the other districts. And it, was, it basically was creating, um, it created differently than the rest of them, so to speak. So Briargate was kind of add as you go. Rather than having, if you see the red boundaries, I've got two other maps you can look at a little closer as well when we're done. But the red boundary is the outside boundary. Um, on the east side, it's Powers. Um, on, the, on the north end, it would be Briargate Parkway. On the west end, it's Chapel Hills, more or less. And then on the, on the south side, it's, it's Wood. But it was kind of as-you-go property. When they, when they got all done, they realized that, you know, for whatever reason, that was long before I started, there were properties that were omitted. Okay, that's the... For the most part, the, the yellow, not the solid yellow, some of the properties that don't pay in are um, 501c properties or city properties that are tax exempt and don't pay in, but the residential properties that are outlined there, okay? Yeah, um, so 
when you look at the map as well, you can come up here afterwards, but all the, the, the green... Okay. So, I can't see it too well up here, but uh, actually you can. The, the dark green areas are the areas that we maintain. Those are the ones that were ordinanced in for uh, maintenance. That, so as you look at the different streetscapes, the majority of them are along major corridors like Austin Bluffs and um, Woodman, Lexington, that type of thing. And there's some, some trail corridors as well that are mixed in. So those are the identified areas that we're responsible for maintaining. So this is an example of, of Norwood SIMD. It's different in terms, of, again, the way it was created. Um, the boundaries were set. The outside boundaries were set first, and everything that was inside of that boundary that was developed later pays in. So it was much clearer. It wasn't an ad as you go. It was clearly defined from the get-go. So that, that is a big difference. When you look at this one, um, everybody, all the residential folks that are inside that boundary pay in. Here's a quick funding comparison of, of the three major districts. You have Stetson Hills, Norwood, and Briargate. Um, Briargate, or I'm sorry, Norwood is the one that is um, kind of the benchmark in terms of um, funding, uh, being the healthiest. So when you look, starting at the top, you have uh, Stetson Hills, which is uh, 20 acres of irrigated turf. So we kind of base things on irrigated turf because that's the most intensive maintenance. Irrigation, fertilizer, mowing really requires the most uh, money when you, when you look at maintenance operations. Norwood's got about 42 acres, and then Briargate's the largest, 88 acres. And if you start looking at some of the numbers, the total assessed valuation, Norwood it all has close to the same amount as Briargate. Okay, if you're just looking at the white lines here. So kind of look across, and you see compared to Norwood, um, Briargate's about half of what Norwood is right now. And if you drop down to that kind of that uh, orangish pinkish line there, the untaxed properties within Briargate SIMD, about 2,200 of them. It's about 20, would create about 23% more uh, revenue if they were included into the district. Uh, adding, you know, that would be a significant um, portion of our budget that would be um, obviously moves in the right direction. Um, so that, that kind of shows you bringing the total. It's still below what we would say ideal, but it would be much better than off than we are now. So here's just some of the challenges. When you look at our budget here in just a minute, or our history of our budgets over the last 10 years, I mean, as we know, you know, prices are increasing for everything. Water is one of our largest charges in our line of the budget. We have about 38% of our budget goes directly to irrigation water costs. So water costs over the last 11 years, 124% increase. So again, this is a, one, of the, one of the major costs that just increased significantly over the years. Here's some of the staff reductions. As you'll see our budget here in just a minute, there, you know, and over the years before I even started, there was decisions made and ways to try to accommodate for the decreasing budget over the years. So these are some of the um, reductions and cuts that have been made. If you look at the irrigation, 24 inches and 17 inches, full-time staff. We used to have four full-time um, staff uh, employees. We have three now, or 3.6 this year. Um, tree replacements, the equipment replacements, fertilizer was cut, so on and on. So this is, the numbers might be kind of small to read, but I just really want to, sh this really kind of tells the story a little bit of really the last 10 years of our budget. When you look back to 2009, I, I tried to really summarize it as, as, as best I could. You look down, you see total salary benefits, um, utilities, and you have other o &M costs, which would be like fertilizer, and irrigation, type things, um, tree replacements, herbicide applications. So, you know, as you go across there from 2009 to, to this year, you see our total this year is 930,000. It's, it's very similar to what it was back in, 
you know, 2009. So we look at, again, the cost, our water cost, 348,000 was in our budget this year, to 238. Well, that water, as I mentioned, it doesn't go near as far if you're paying 125% more. So this gives you a snapshot when you look at the, the other O&M expenses, 123,000 compared to close to 200,000. Again, those are some of the cuts in maintenance operations that we've had to make to the fertilizer, herbicides, and, and other things like that. So, it's, so looking ahead, I mean, a big part of why we're here tonight is to, to look ahead and see what options there are, what things, as you guys are informed about what's going on, what steps we can, we can take. Um, maintain status quo, I would say we've been operating um, at this, in this area for a while. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've made some cuts. We're looking at some, some proven cuts as well. We're trying to find more appropriate landscape materials. We've made some conversions, converting high, um, you know, high maintenance Kentucky bluegrass to lower native type grasses. Um, we've had to make some decisions this year to cut out some of our annual beds. We're looking at trying to incorporate perennials in some of those beds. So less maintenance, less water, less resources, those types of things. But we're just, you know, we're having to make do with what we have and, and try to be proven with what we can, but that, that only goes so far. All right, next one is to increase the total assessed valuation. As I showed you one slide there, there's um, about 2,250 properties that could potentially be paying in that aren't currently. That would take a vote. We'll talk a little bit more about that perhaps tonight. But that is another option um, that we're looking at. And then there's the mill levy. As I mentioned, the mill levy's come down and started out as, at five. Um, back when the, um, the, you know, the, the district was created, it's down to 4.4 now. So this gives you an idea if the mill is to go up, okay? And that would add about $10 to the average property tax bill. The average property tax bill, roughly, folks that are paying into is about $80, okay? So this would add about an additional $10 to that property tax bill. And then the next slide shows if it was to be raised to six, you know, the $300,000 that it would generate, um, that would be about an additional $25 to, to the property tax bill. So. Again, we're just looking at options. That's a big part of why we're here tonight, and it's, that's really all I have, so. Um, we'll, do, we'll deal with questions. Afterwards, okay. Um, Pardon? First thing is I am really, really uncomfortable with microphones. I will use it, but if I am loud enough for everybody to hear, um, I prefer this. Are you guys, can you hear me or do you want me to use the microphone? And if you can't hear me, raise your hand, please. All right, um, since August, I have been meeting, we've all been meeting, and we've continued to meet um, regarding this issue. And the city attorney um, has been very, very helpful in trying to unravel these various um, uh, conundrums that we're dealing with. Um, frankly, the approach that we have been taking and the, and the approach that I've heard from, from most of the constituents um, since August and before has been, let's make this a matter of equity and fairness. Um, to give you just a little bit of a background, an SIMD, we, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a district that is no longer in use. The reason that there's only six of them, <clears throat> seven, is because of the difficulties that were incumbent in them. They've been replaced with other types of districts. Um, and this was the first SIMD, and in the early 80s, it was not administered well. And so what we have is we have those 2,250 properties that are excluded as a matter of property right. Um, and so they, they cannot be included in the SIMD without a vote of the people in those yellow, in those, those yellow areas. Um, we are, and, and, and so we, we've been wrestling with what is the best way um, to get all of the properties 
that should be benefiting from this common maintenance and these common maintenance decisions to contribute equally and equitably. One of the things that I think I need to emphasize is that the people in the, 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 the property owners in the yellow aren't bad people. They didn't do anything wrong. They bought the property knowing what the property was saying. The people in the blue areas didn't know any better because when they went and bought their properties, they didn't know that there was this difference between the two. So I really want to avoid any kind of, of, of accusations or anything. These were just erroneous decisions that were made 20 and 30 years ago that, that leave us in this situation where we are at right now. And so I want to start from where we are at right now and how to go forward. And so I'm going to propose something to you guys tonight. Um, I also want to emphasize that for those of you who weren't there or don't remember from August, this is in my district. So I am the appropriate council member to be taking this on and to be talking to you guys about this. However, my wife in my home is not a member of the district. And so because a district is essentially a, 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 a decision for self-governance, the developers 30 years ago said, we're going to make this district for the people to be instruments of self-governance. Any changes to the district and any new district, which is what I'm going to propose, is going to be a decision of you, not me. Does that make sense? I'm not going to be one of the people who get to choose what you guys are going to want to do. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be involved in it and walk through it with you all and make the recommendations based upon my representation as a member of city council. Our house, um, if you go back, our house is located about <clears throat> here. So I'm outside the district, so I'm not a voter, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so what we have decided to propose to you is a replacement district, to investigate the possibility of a replacement district. That the mill, the, 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 the SIMD documents say that the city administers the district, and that city council approves the budget in any given year and approves the mills. The SIMD can have a mill levy of zero if the city council chooses to do that. And so the SIMD as a district would continue, for those of you who know a little bit about corporate law, it's as if the corporation continues in existence but doesn't do anything. It's, just, it's, it's a creature just as a matter of law. So the SIMD would remain in place the mill levy would be set to zero. So on the, on, on the line from the assessor, it would be zero. And that would be done if the community as a whole, all the electors in the district, choose by majority vote to replace the SIMD with a BID. It's not a BID, it's a GID. 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 There's lots of things, yes. General <laughs> Improvement District, GID, okay? And so the idea would be, if you want to go further, um, to start the process of creating what we'll call the Briargate General Improvement District. <clears throat> and I want to back up and say why that this is so complicated. When the developer set up the SIMD, when developers and builders set up GIDs now, we are talking about five or six people who own a huge amount of property, have an idea of what they want to do with that property, like the developers of Briargate decided many, many years ago. And the six of them vote and say, this is what we want to do. That's relatively easy. We are dealing with 7,500 properties, roughly, in Briargate. Uh, almost 10,000. Um, 10,000. So, so you take those six 
and you multiply it by 1500 and those are the that's the pool of electors if you would who have to decide what it is they want to do it is so complicated and so specialized that the city attorney says that they are comfortable giving general advice only. There's going to need to be a, a, a district-wide attorney who specializes in this kind of, of, of <coughs> decision making. I've talked to an attorney that I'm familiar with from years back. I asked for a general assessment you know what what would be the general cost of setting up a, a a different kind of district and he estimates that it's going to be between twenty five and fifty thousand dollars i've talked to a representative of, of um, the the sim board and they said that that there's enough money in reserves to cover that that would be the responsibility of the simd If a GID is set up to go to the electors, the question is who are the electors? They are probably the property owners, not necessarily the residents. And then the question is, how many electors? Is it, is it husband and wife that both get to elect? <clears throat> probably not. It's probably one vote per property. It's just my gut reaction. But we're going to have to have that attorney say that so so there, there's a lot of nuance in all this but ultimately it's going to have to be a decision by the electors and when we'll, it's going to have to okay we're going to go back i'm going to go through this um it's going to have to be a decision by the electors and the it's the city attorney says and contrary to what we thought in august is it's going to have to be a November election. It has to be a November election. So, so hopefully we can move from here where we are at now, and hopefully if this is what is decided as the approach to go forward, there will be a special question for the Briargate uh, groups on the November election as to whether or not to have a general improvement district, okay? All that kind of makes sense. We can go back and do questions. Um, the the cost to put it on the election is going to be pro, depend. It, it depends on how many other questions are out there and how many districts and turn you know um, cities and county. How many people are contributing to questions on the ballot? The more questions there are on the ballot, the less cost there is for the question, but the question itself, if it comes to go to city council, I believe is gonna be paid for by the city. I'm not 100% certain of that, but I believe that the city would bear the cost of that. As a District 2 representative, I will push hard to say that the city should bear that cost. Um, not gonna make promises to that, but I do think that that's a city city cost as opposed to the cost of is, is it a question that we can hold on to or oh, i think it's pertinent okay i guess i missed why can't we fix the smid we sort of start of jump to this okay well, I, I can tell you why and that's a really good question and i and i thank you for bringing that up um for people in the yellow they buy their property everybody here has bought a house I assume at some point or another when you buy your house you buy your house with the title right the title comes through and says here are the impediments on your house and you buy it subject to those impediments because those impediments are part of property law this is this is my understanding I'm going to say but but they're part of property law and so those impediments include these assessments and so as a matter of property law, the people in the blue buy their houses subject to those impediments. The people in yellow buy them free of those impediments. So, so you cannot fix the SIMD without the people in yellow 
not to, but, but the people in the yellow group, voting to say we want to have that impediment placed on our property. And that's, that's, that, frankly, as we're looking at, if you go back to that, um, that picture, if you, go, um, <coughs> if you look at it, if the city attorney and I look at it, we were thinking that's going to take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, probably ten special elections for each of the ten special groups. And so the complexity of it is actually that much harder, assuming that the majority of the people in the yellow say they're willing to opt or they're willing to have an election, and then the people vote as a majority to enter into it. Um, and so the, the, that's why the complexity is that much harder. It's because, because of Tabor, because of things that happened, frankly, after 1983. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I just, all of a sudden we were talking about Right. It, it, so I appreciate you bringing that up because I, I, I've, been, I've been working with this for a year and a half, so I'm assuming knowledge that maybe you guys don't have, so I appreciate that. So I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying by creating this new uh, replacement district, this general improvement district, which includes the yellow and the purple in this one election. It takes the veto power away from the folks. In the what, it, what it is is, and, it, and it's simple majority rule. So they. Will that's not what be we are to. hoping. That's what we are hoping. Again, got to understand that this is some specialized legal knowledge that we are doing the best that we know right now, and the desire is as a community, as a group, to say. And and I don't think there's. One thing I do want to say is I've talked to a lot of homeowners who are in the yellow, and a lot of the homeowners want to have the common issues and the common areas that, that everybody up there is, is dealing with. They, they're willing to come in. As a matter of fact, before Tabor, there were a couple of groups that did opt in. Unfortunately, because of Tabor, we no longer have that simplified opting in provision that we were able to do before. So there's a lot there, there's a lot of owners in the yellow who really do want to come into this and recognize that there is this, this lack of, of fairness and that it benefits all the property owners. So before it, 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 we'll get to general questions and I, I am sorry to, to take this out. I did want to walk through just generally what what the, um, the timeline is going to look like as best as we can figure out. And um, um, just generally discuss what needs to be done at, at, on a community neighborhood wide level. Um, we're going to have to get uh, a petition. Um, well, is this the first one that we have? I'm going to go by, by this one first, okay? You guys should have the timeline that the city attorney put together. The city attorney put this together as best as he could with the limited expertise he had, which is why, me being a former attorney, he's giving you this qualifier. Because we don't know if there's other stuff that needs to come in. But, um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to get 200 people in that district, in that geographical area, to um, sign a petition that says we want to start the process of pursuing a GID, okay? Um, and um, you can see the information that's required to be there. Um, and essentially what we would be talking about is the physical boundaries that exist now, which have to include, if you noticed in the upper left-hand corner of the map, this is such a weird thing that across on the other side of uh, Chapel Hill Mall is part of the district. Um, but um, it, it is either 30% or 200 electors, and it is clear that 200 electors is, the, is much lower than the 30%. 30% is going to be about 350, 400 at the minimum. Um, pardon me? 3,400. 30. There's 10. Oh, there's 10, 3,400, yes. That's all right, nobody, nobody voted for me because of my 
<laughs> um, there's the, 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 the question of needing to file um, a cost bond um, and the cost of the proceedings. Um, like I said, um, this would be an election, uh, but I, I, I don't think the cost to try to form this is going to be that much other than the attorney's fees, and the attorney's fees by that point would already be paid. Okay? Um, we have to file a hearing. The hearing is, is in front of city council. By the way, every member on city council knows about this unique situation. Everybody on city council knows how complicated it is, and everybody on city council wants to get this fixed. So they know what we're working at here. We're not going to have issues, at least with the council currently constructed. We do have an election in a few months. Um, but we're not going to have a problem getting the city council to get on board with this, because the city council is all known this, and the mayor knows this. So, so it's not going to be an issue there. Um, the court is going to have to then go ahead and set up a, an election that is consistent with the because the decision that is being made by all of you would essentially be we as a community want to have a GID that sets the mill levy at X for, for, for these purposes. But again, as we're talking about, we are talking about literally replacing the SIMD with the GID it, it is simpler to simply keep the SIMD in effect setting zero on, on, on the mills. So it, it, it exists in name only. Um, the court would then go ahead and hopefully approve this item being placed on the ballot for next November. Um, then, assuming the GID is created, it comes back to City Council because City Council administers all of these special districts, and we say it's formed um, and it's filed with the county clerk. The county clerk then, on your property bill, would collect the assessment as part of the Briar Bay GID as, as opposed to the SIP but it would hopefully collect it from everybody. So that, that's it in a nutshell. I want you to know that that nutshell comprises hours and hours and hours of meetings, which is filled by multiple more hours of research by the city attorney as to what comes next. So how I see things proceeding at this point, if this is something that you folks want to try to pursue is we need to, to start setting up um, a task force if you will, or, or a group to say we want to start going out we want to start to collect signatures um, we want to I, I think that there's a really good approach to have a door-to-door -door kind of thing uh, maybe setting up little neighborhood meetings um, I'll, I'll attend when I can I will do my best to support this because this really is the biggest complicated issue affecting District 2 in the city right now. Um, and, and, and seeing if we can get momentum and movement down this path. Does that all make sense? Um, and so, I think, I think we are now at the point of questions, comments. Um, so if you'll raise your hands, I'm going to kind of start over in this corner and make my way over, and I'll try to get all of you. We have probably about 30 minutes for questions. Okay. We'll start back in this corner. Are there any representatives here from the yellow areas? It's a good question. Rich, are, is there anybody here who lives in one of the yellow areas right now? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can, do you want me to, to ask? I will. I will ask Paul. What do you guys generally? What do you guys think about this? Yeah. Uh, in my conversations within our community, everybody I've talked to voluntarily put their property in a GID. 
don't know that anybody quite recognizes what the kingdom is as I am, but that really needs to go away and just need to focus on figuring out how to get the kingdom to be closer. I don't think it would be opposed by any of the people in government if we're looking at the tax increase and, you know, $90 a year. It's roughly what it would be. Is, you know, I, I, I can't say that, but, but five mills, as you know, is, what is that? That's five dollars for every hundred thousand dollars. No, it's, it, it, it's five millions a year. So it's, it, it really is not a whole lot. So, thank you. Uh, there was somebody else over here who was yelling for I was just gonna ask about, so I, I represent that, that, I guess you'd call it like a horseshoe in the middle of the biggest yellow there. Um, I'm the past president of the HOA, so I know most of the people who live there. There's 270 homes. And first, most people don't even know about the special right. And the second, the one that do know about it, do not want a tax increase. Right. So um, there's a, a large gap of information that has to be yeah, and then, then they also feel like because they represent such a large swath of the people that are not in it, if everybody else is voting, they get outnumbered, even though they might not want to be a part of it because the majority of the people are already in it. Right. So there's a disparity there between the people who want to get in it and the people who are already in it that's going to bring more money into it. Right. I understand the need for it, but people just don't have the information to make that kind of and, 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 right and that's why I'm saying we need to have the the door-to-door the, the -door exactly. kind of stuff to have the smaller meetings. We really do need to, 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 to start that process. So I agree with you 100%. And then, okay, are we going back to general questions? Like, you were yellow, right? I, I just wanted to get to three people who raised their hands from the yellow. I did want to bring this up at this time, but I think I ought to now. Um, I'm making day about three concerns and one comment. And the first concern is she made a statement that we wanted to avoid accusations. And as the SIMDs, this was presented last time on KOAA, the uh, reporter said that, quote, not all homeowners are paying their fair share. Well, that de facto throws that was, so that's, that's the reporter's way of preventing I understand that has anybody um, contradicted if anybody called KOAA and said, stop, stop, stop. That's not what we're about. That needs to happen. I, I talked to the guy from KOAA did a really, from my perspective, fair job of trying to present something. Okay, that's just one point. Okay. I understand. Um, the other thing is this is really about a city budget problem. And the city assumed the risk when they decided to put green spaces in Colorado Springs in 1983 in an arid climate. And then they failed to adapt over time as the climate's changed and water prices have gone up. Um, the other thing is I don't think the city's earned the trust of some of the residents like you brought up, sir. Um, in that neighborhood, which um, you hear me right, sir? What's that? Is it your name? I'm, I'm, I'm Dale Neeson. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. As Joe brought up, the, there was a lot of neglect on streets and sidewalks. And when this came up one time at a council or at a uh, homeowner's meeting, uh, some of the members had gone to some of the neighborhoods that were in the SMB and they didn't see an appreciable return for the tax dollar. And then with the whole incident with the 2C road with the bike lanes on research, again, there's a lack of trust in, for many of the neighbors here. So that's the first concern. Or the second. Well, let's, let's, let's the third concern, almost done. The third concern we have is the quote that the mill level winning is not stretching as far as It's hard to understand you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Take that, would you please? Um, people can't hear um, On the mill level, the, the dollars aren't stretching as far as they, they used to. That's true for a lot of people. We have a lot of retirees who are on fixed incomes, and they're on Social Security and retirements, and they're living from paycheck to paycheck. And the tax increase strikes terror in their hearts. And um, we all know that prices are going up. I have neighbors that have to choose between taking medicine or eating. And my parish, over Thanksgiving, collected scores of dinners for people in District 20, which is supposedly affluent, for people who couldn't buy a Thanksgiving dinner. 
So if we're going to do something like this, we should do something that's compassionate too, and maybe grandfather folks who have been there for a long time who are not seeing increases in their social security or their, their retirement check because the alternatives to kick them out. And we already have a large population of nomads and trailers downtown um, because people lost their homes to the crisis. So that's just something else, another concern. Thank the you. last thing I have, last comment, is the option seem very stilted. There's several options, but what about zero state? We're going to spend money on an attorney, on a GIMB election. Couldn't we begin a transition from green space to more natural space so we don't have to irrigate 88 acres, but we can substantially cut that down? And, and, that, and, and part of that from, from the August meeting is the exp that's expensive to do. We agree to I, I, I to understand that, that, but that, that, that it's, it's a question of, of being able to afford to make those choices. And let's be innovative and find a way to do it. Okay, okay. we're going to keep going forward. And let's actually thank you so much for your concerns. I yes. appreciate the passion. Uh, we want to keep it to questions um, and make sure um, if, what, if there was a question or a topic that has already been talked about, let's try to do something new. But thank you, sir, for your passion. I happen to be a, a blue area resident, and many of us have seen the areas, common areas around our homes, deteriorate because of lack of maintenance. And, and part of that is they're treating the current areas in a xeriscaping manner when they weren't designed that way. So trees are dying, weeds are growing, uh, holes are creating, sand hills and all. And so, um, Establishing a GID dissolution of the SIMD seems like a great legal process and a long time consuming one. And no doubt there are many lawyers involved in establishing that, that option. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I tend to look at it a little bit simpler. Why don't you just have an option that says if you pay for the maintenance, you get the maintenance. If you don't pay for the maintenance, you don't get it. So stop doing the maintenance in areas that are surrounded by the yellow. And if that's the case, maybe when those areas start to decrease, or people don't want them to get to that point anyway, then um, they'll, they'll want in on this whole SIMD thing. Okay. Now, this, this gentleman he has good points with regard to uh, retirees. I'm a retiree. There are many, many retirees in the area uh, within a mile radius of my home. Right. Yeah. So uh, my my vote would be keep it simple. People that are paying for the maintenance get the maintenance. People that aren't paying for it let the budget uh, reflect the new item on the city council budget to to support that if the people don't want to opt in themselves. And and that's a great. A great comment. I will say legally, we've looked at that. Legally, the SIMD documents impose the responsibility to maintain all the common areas on, it's not on the city. And, and, and there, this is a very important distinction to make. It is imposed on the district. The district is administered by the city, but the district is independent of the city. So the district has the responsibility of maintaining all the areas encircled in red legally. And if the city did not maintain areas that, that are you know, above the yellow, um, that would be a violation of the, the SIMD document. It would be the violation of that. Um, but we've looked at that. We'll look closer. We will look closer to see if there's a way to go ahead and do that. Thank you. I thought they did that with the pot. It's not like that was all uh, could, could, could you explain again how the yellow areas uh, are legally exempted? Sure. I, I don't understand that. Because when I read through the uh, document that created this district, they should have been in. It 
says that every homeowner will be given notification by the seller that they are in this district. Right. And, 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 and it's uh, out of all the complexity of trying to get out of this, what got us into it is fairly simple. Sometime, somewhere, somebody in the mid to late 80s, early 90s forgot to do that for the houses in the yellow. So the people who bought the houses in the yellow originally were not told of that. Okay. Now and that's, that's a developer developed those areas. It wasn't myself selling my house to the second owner. It was the developer. I, 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 I suspect, I, I have deliberately not looked to see who's responsible for originally doing that, because that's not going to be able to do, it's not going to do us any good. It's not. We can say it may have been the developer, and I think in some cases it probably was. It may have been a city employee in some place. I assume it probably was. It could have been a, a builder in some place. It probably was. Um, but what happened is in 83, 84, 85, those houses were sold to the original purchaser without that information being communicated and without, most importantly, without that impediment on the title being included. And once it's sold without the impediment on the title being included, they're free of that impediment. Not only the original purchasers, but all subsequent purchasers. And that's why, that's why I really want to emphasize nobody in the yellow is, is, is a bad person. I will say, fundamentally, from a, from a, from a global standpoint, the, 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 the buyers in the blue are subsidizing the buyers in the yellow, not for any good or bad intent. And that does relate to the buyers in the yellow are not paying the fair share. It doesn't mean anything bad about that. It's just the way it is. And so I think here we are, 30 some odd years later, and my approach is to start from where we are and see what we can do to move forward. Well, but this, this uh, document says that all platinum properties in that district are subject to the tax. Right. And How can they be excluded? And, and, and because, I, I, just property law. When you buy something without the impediment, you're free of that impediment. Even though the document says that, when I, if I, if, it, if I were in there and I bought the yellow, when I buy in the yellow, I'm free of that document. Because I don't buy the document. When, when, when the people in blue buy their property subject to that document, because the title says that document is controlling as far as that's concerned. The people in yellow are free from it. And that's because proper individual property law triumphs over that. Anybody else on this side? This way. Okay. Then we'll come back, Carlos. We'll get to all questions, and I will stay late. I promise. Hi, my name is Wendy. Um, I don't live in this district right now. I saw this in the news a couple days ago, and I had to come in here and say this. Um, I'm in the energy industry, and I'm talking about people's electric bills all the time. The next nastiest bill they have is their water bill. And this is absolutely true for you guys, too. The streets here are beautiful. Briargate is beautiful. The wide streets with the green meat. Mm -hmm. We have to do something about our water consumption. It, no matter what you guys decide to do, GID, SMID, the other guys in or out, whatever you guys do, you have to make a change with how you're irrigating. Because this is crazy. It's 350000 this year. It's going to be 375, 400. Next year, it's going to be more source. Not to mention, we don't have enough water here. Yeah. And people talk about Xeriscape, and they, a lot of us cringe because we think that means rocks. But if you study anybody who knows anything about plants, 
the horticulture arts societies, and even the nurseries in town, they'll tell you, xeriscape does not mean hard, heat, harboring surfaces. Xeriscape means using native plants and grasses. There's a gentleman in Denver who hybridized a type of grass called African dog tooth. It sounds very exotic. It's green grass. It looks great. It never gets more than four inches tall. You can water it once a month. And, and it's ridiculous. Just, Eric wants to address it because Eric wants to do stuff like that. Right up my ass. Yeah. There, there is some initial cost on in the front end, but it's kind of like you're going to pay for good shoes so you don't have to buy another pair in six months. You're going to keep them for years. That's what the cost for this type of grass. And you wouldn't do it all at once. You do it in sections. I printed up some information about this. You guys investigated. It's up to you. But our, our use of water is kind of madness in the city. In a semi-arid climate, we're akin to like, the desert. This is crazy. And you can have beautiful, green, flowering, xeric landscapes. They do not have to be rock covered. I, I agree 100%. So my, my background is water conservation. I've worked at the Xeriscape Garden for six years. I've worked with city parks for three years in terms of just conservation, doing this very thing that you're talking about. Of about 70 acres of example around the city where we're taking bluegrass and converting it to native grasses and doing that very thing, reducing our water footprint. So it's an initiative for our city and it will be an initiative in all these special districts because you're right. I mean, 30 years ago, when these were, landscapes were created, you know, water wasn't in their thoughts. I mean, it was so. I echo what you say, it's, it's right on, and we're making efforts, and we we'll continue to make efforts. I mean, there's Regard a, there's regardless a, of what happens, absolutely. we continue to make yeah, those absolutely. efforts. Absolutely. There's an appropriate place for bluegrass, it's not on uh, the right away medium. It's <laughs> an athletic field that, that just costs such part of the Go ahead. Yeah, I think, sorry about that. Um, question about the commercial properties. We've been talking about the residential properties versus the commercial properties and you know the interaction with Gallagher and Paper and Platts and been in the news. But uh, I'm looking at the map. Um, there is a yellow property there in the middle and there's also kind of a brownish property. I think the brownish, which you call it yellow, I think is the untaxed area of the residence. But there's also the yellow and those are what commercial? Is that correct? Uh, I believe so so my, so my question is is that you see those yellow areas like for example I think there's gonna be some of the schools that's right uh, the one by Fort Creek Park is a uh, commercial property but, but 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 my understanding is um, is is commercial also contributes the in, in the SIMB, correct? And that's my question. Is the commercial yeah, included? It, okay. It should be and and it should be from a GID standpoint as well. But again it goes back to from my perspective, it would go back to the electors, which is the property owners. And the property owners are the ones that have to agree to this because the property owners are then agreeing to an impediment on the properties. So it does, does not matter then whether it's a residential property or if it's a commercial property, even though the taxing rates are different under the other. I, 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 I tend to think you are correct. Um, I would defer to the city attorney for a stronger tendency, and I would defer if we get that far to the special attorney for the definitive statement, but I, I, I envision that it's all problems. Okay, I think I'm coming over to the other side. You got your hand I would like to know the difference between an SIMD and a GID. Okay. Because right now, our trees are dying on dynamic. Um, as far as personal uh, ownership, I think that that is an easy thing to do. I, I actually adopted two high, uh, fire hydrants in my block, and I went one day and I picked up the trash around um, our block. I cut uh, suckers without permission, <laughs> and um, it was one block that was cleaned up, and I, we had, Jim and I had talked to our neighbors. At the library, there were uh, double the amount that there are here. 
So I'm concerned about also the door to door. If somebody comes to, to my door and I don't know who it is, I don't answer the door. Um, where the solicitors are, is there, like, can we send a postcard? Uh, is there somewhere, do we stand at a library? Uh, you know, a public place where, because I agree with the lack of education as far as all this SIMD, GID thing is going on. And also, if it changes to GID, are we going to be responsible for the code enforcement? I just code see a lot of things that are happening in the neighborhood where people just don't care. Code enforcement is neighborhood services. And as far as the specific questions about what to come next, I think Sarah's going to address that at the end of the meeting. Because there are, there, there are some steps that we need to take that come next. And, and we'll, you know, if this is something that we at least want to explore, and Sarah will be able to talk about that. Yes, a, a comment, a comment to follow that by observation, and also this comment also applies to the idea of don't don't maintain the common areas that are adjacent to the untaxed areas. And let's just get nasty about that. Well, our observation is that because of our budgetary limitations now and the decreasing manpower, the decreasing water, the decreasing maintenance in the common areas, as we walk our neighborhood, we are also seeing personal care of personal property is decreasing. And that will, that will change if the common areas are brought back up to standard over, and I know it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but the neighborhood attitude of the individuals will follow will follow the public response One of the, to these things. And, and, and thank you for bringing that up. I've talked to the president of the, uh, the local real, realtors, you know, um, and, and I, I'd love to bring a realtor here or somebody from the community who is a realtor to talk about how maintenance of the common areas does in fact have that kind of, of, of effect on, on the broader community and how it enhances property value of, of all. One of the things that, that some people may have, have noticed is that there, there are HOAs. There are a lot of HOAs up there that maintain their own HOA properties. And so one of the questions that I've seen is, well, you know, um, we initially tried to do this two years ago, and we scheduled a, a um, I, I got tons of, um, of, of emails and telephone calls from residents as to why is all the grass dying? And so in May and in the, in the, in the early part of June, remember that? We scheduled an appointment and scheduled a meeting um, at the YMCA, and the earliest we could do it was July, and we said, everybody come here, and we're gonna start this. And we tried to start this two years ago. What happened is that in June, it was Noah's second rain. And so we had rain for several, several weeks, and all the grass greened up. And so by the time we got to the meeting, we had three people show up. Because it wasn't an issue anymore. So, so, but what, what people were noticing is all of these areas are really green and then you get to, to my street and it's brown. And then it becomes green again. That was something that they were observing. What they saw were HOAs maintaining the HOA properties, the city doing what it could with the limited resources it had for all the common areas, and then the HOA again. And, and I don't think anybody, it's in, it's in nobody's best, best interest to have that kind of, of checkerboard approach. Okay, thank you. That so, was, and, that, and that was my observation. Now I have three questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned the possibility in this process of SIMD to GID. Right. You said there may have to be a district, an SIMD attorney. Right. Who would pay what? Where's the funding for that attorney? Out of the SIMD? The funds? SIMD does have some reserves, um, and I've talked to uh, Mr. Dubois about that. He's on the board. The board is, 
because it's a special district as opposed to city, the way it works, and for those of you who don't even know, is you guys are represented by your district representatives. And so you have four district representatives now. Three of them are present tonight. Uh, a fifth is available. And, and there would have to be a vote by those representatives to say, okay, we are going to authorize taking this money and paying the attorney. But we would we in the in, in the, the district from from, from the that. funds that are there now. Okay. Next question. Um, the numbers the numbers as, as we walk in as we walk in late there was there was uh, the previous presenter who was talking. It was about, Eric? Uh, Eric is the administrator. Mill level mill levies and right. what happens if it goes from this to that or this to that? Did did those numbers include? Only the present taxpayers. Yes. Or or the. Or or just just if, if, if we increase the bill levies on the blue without a, a, a touching the yellow. Okay. Okay. And you, David, you talked about making the SIMD an empty an empty right an operation. Empty. Is there a cost? Is there any annual cost to do business? No. And not do business. No. There's no, no, there's the, no the, the, the city, fees to pay the state or anything The like city that. council, the city council would continue to administer, the city council would continue to administer the SMI, the SIMD. The city council would be the administrator of the GID on a year-to-year -year basis. It's what we did with the stormwater enterprise. I shouldn't say we, I wasn't on it. But the stormwater enterprise was an empty vessel for several years. Every year, the city council voted zero until we passed the, you know, the, the city passed the recent um, stormwater fee. Um, so every year, there would be a resolution to set the mills for the SM, SMID at zero. And every year, the city council would set it at zero. There would then be a, a resolution to set the GID at whatever and to approve this budget. Yes, the SIMD then is not, then not incurring any liability. No liability, nothing. Well, well, mine was just sort of a simple one. You said that the city council knows this is a problem. The, the other city council men and women. Thing. Know. I was just wondering, I sort of feel forgotten as a Briargate resident. Not, I mean, no chip on my shoulder, but I'm just saying we're not the you know, deluxe community anymore. So where does this sort of come from for them to know that this is a problem? Do they get I told emails? Them. Oh. I told them. Because, because every December, we just did it again. So, so in December of 2017, um, because we tried to have the uh, meeting in the summer of 2017, in December of 2017, City Council uh, sits as the board of the, the approving board for each of these districts. So we were approving all the other SMID, SIMDs. We were approving the budgets for the GIDs. When we got to this one, I said, we're going to slow down for a second. I want to tell you guys what's going on with this. And so I told the other city council members that this is where we are at, that we're going to approve. You know, I'm recommending approval of the budget at that point in time. Um, we had already started some of these discussions. I said, you know, the no new, net, no new taxes thing is going to come back to buy. I said, but I'm not going to approve this in 2018 unless we get this thing figured out. Um, and so I've been talking to city council members. You have an, a, a councilman at large who does live in the districts, by the way. Um, and um, then the city attorney in the several meetings we were having, Kono, we realized we weren't going to be able to get this done by the end of 2018. So when 2018 came up, I said, guys, this is a lot more complicated. This is the movements that we've made. They know what's going on. And I had a conversation um, with, with another one of the council members about it today when he asked me what I was doing tonight. And, and, and it was, uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but he said, you know, initially, that's such an easy thing to do. You know, it seems all you do is you bring the people in the yellow to the people in the blue, and, and which is what I thought. And then, and, then, and then he said, 
but you start to go through it. That's a lot more complicated than I ever thought it would be. That's going to take a whole year to resolve. And then I said, and by the way, who do you think the electors are? He said, the voters in the group. I said, this is an SI, you know, an, a, this is a special district. It was, oh my gosh, that's an entirely other question. So these are complicated entities to begin with. And then to undo what was done 30 years ago and to do what we need to do now, it's going to take some time. But, but they know about it because I've been engaged with this and I tell them. Well, that's, that's how the council members work. Did you get work. a lot of emails about property degradation or something? Or what? Well, we did initially. It, it, it all came, it all came to, to, to bear. Initially, when, when I first came on council, Eric's predecessor asked to set an appointment with me because he said, you got elected, if you don't know about this, you need to know about this. And this is a problem, Richard. This, this, the other thing that, they, they, even though this has been in the pipeline for some 30 years, it really didn't start to emerge until about six years ago. We, we, well, the, the drought happened, and the, 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 the economic uh, collapse happened, um, and in about six years ago, there was this observation that what was going on now simply wasn't sustainable. So it has been a problem on the forefront for about six or seven years. But Richard? As a matter of history, we started before with this process, bringing this to light with your predecessor. With Larry. Well, Larry, but he ran into so many roadblocks, and with Eric's predecessor, being on the board for a couple of years, we just kept running into Stonewall everywhere we tried to, to go to correct this situation, because the water bill kept going right. on every year that rolled around, and we just could not get any assistance in bringing this situation to light, and we just keep going farther and farther. Spending our reserves. So, so the one thing I would say is this has not been ignored for 30 some odd years. It has been trying to get our, our arms around it for five, maybe just trying to get somebody's attention. Right. To, to start for about five. So so that's that's why we're here. Sorry, Sarah. It's okay. We've got a question here and here, and so we might have to be here. We might have to be good with questions. Yeah, a couple, just a couple comments. Uh, a lot of the green areas really are green. There for a while, and Fox lived there, and like right. and stuff. So that's kind of a misnomer. Maybe we could paint a little dark room. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, a lot of the grass that gets watered is, is on homes. Is on what? Is on homes, um, mediums. The water runs off, and the, the concrete tries to grow, but it just can't do it on the street. So we have a real problem there. And what I, I would like to see is let's fix the source of the problem. Instead of painting over the problem, so let's let's get a master plan of what we're going to do to zero scale this stuff. Get uh, drip lines around trees, flowers, instead of spraying water on the streets. I think a lot of people would be a lot more willing to fund that, so that our future costs are going to be a lot less. I think Eric can look at that. I, I he. Had, he in, in August talked about some of his ideas and some of the what he hopes to be able to ultimately do there. So do you want to well may I mean, just say that I can't agree more in costs obviously there's a capital expense that's involved with any type of you know, transitioning on irrigation or something like that. Yeah, we have some good numbers on the cost for that. I think there, you know maybe there could be more that's one of the things Sarah's going to talk about. Oh, that's right, you need to go too, so I can't stay that long. So. Um, I'll make this quick, but I have not been a board member that long, but I'm going to kind of defend myself a little bit here and defend the city. There are a lot more moving pieces than you have any idea. They've been short staffed, they've got a 20 year old lawnmower, they've got all kinds of issues going on that until I became on board, I had no idea about. And I, I joined because 
I saw the degradation myself, and it's bothersome. I walk all these trails, I see it. We're this group of people, like myself, we're not stupid. I mean, we're very clear. We're very clear about zero escape. I'm so thrilled we, that we freed up some extra money a little bit ago. You'll see that the trees have been marked, and we finally have some people to come and cut the bad branches out, take down the dread trees. That all came out of a reserve fund that had never been approved before because they've never had the staffing and able to keep the staff like any business in town right now can't keep people on board to take care of these improvement districts. So not only have we suffered because of lack of a budget, we've suffered because they haven't even had the personnel or equipment to deal with it over the last couple of years until just recently. So the few board members that there are are very well aware of all these problems. And yes, we know we need different grass. We know we need different kind of sprinkler heads. We know we need different timers. All those things. But you've only got two and a half people handling three or four improvement districts. So, like you say, unless you want to come up and volunteer and start planting your own flower beds and mowing your own lawns, you know, the, the average college student at 10 bucks an hour could only do so much within our district. Okay. I'm going to give this, and, and, and I will stick around. Sarah needs to leave because it's after 7.30. And so she needs to finish up. Well, we, but I, I want to. Well, we want to make sure we get everyone wrapped up at 7:45, and then we can hang out and for. But I, I will hang out. But if you want to go ahead and handle your stuff, and then I will stick around. I would like. I have one more point. Can you show the, the? A gentleman asked about finances as well. Could you put the financial slide up that shows even if everybody who is in this area contributed that was you just passed it, it right there that does not solve the problem so you can call the district anything you want to get everybody in it it doesn't solve the problem so, Nobody gets it from like 80 to 95% and, and if we replace it, that, that's assuming that we continue with the current SIM, SIMD status and get everybody in versus what do we want the GID to look like? So, so, so the question is what do we want the GID to look like versus just fixing you know, and bringing everybody in from the SIMD? Sure. Thank you. And one thing, um, I'm going to go through a couple slides here for what the next steps are for communication and keeping everyone in the loop since this could be a long year and there's plenty of other people we need to get involved, like 10,000 people. So, um, But some of these points that we're bringing up is it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to, we first we need to catch up before we can see some of the major improvements that we're talking about. But uh, one thing that Kono does is we coach, um, we facilitate meetings, we bring neighbors together, we um, let people know how they can start little neighborhood associations or committees where you are planting, you're finding out from your local resources, from Eric and someone over here, of what's the best kind of plants, and maybe the neighbors donate money or time. Maybe it's time that, that is going into it to say, hey, we want to see the improvements, let's get involved, let's work together. One of our slogans at Kono is better together. Um, because we do feel like um, when we all work together, we can find some good solutions. And sometimes it's not good enough to sit back and wait for someone else to do it. And that's really one thing we try to promote. And we have all kinds of resources. We have a fund that we can actually grant to neighborhoods for a big 40 cubic foot roll off dumpster if you want to do a cleanup, if you're pulling up weeds or whatever it is. We also, um, part of that fund, it could be going towards the purchase of trees. We actually helped the Old North End. Um, with they, they did some fundraising um, with some of their businesses and residents and got enough money to purchase a bunch of trees and they planted them along some of their medians as well. Um, there's some neighbors group that adopt medians, and I know Eric knows a lot more about that as well. Just like adopting a park or um, a roadway for cleanup and um, watering and maintenance and things like that. So
So there's things that can be done. I know we're all busy, we have a lot of things going on, but um, a little bit can go a long way um, in, in a large area. So um, if you want to know more about that, please email me. But I'm going to go through a little bit more here with um, a couple more ideas covered in. But um, one thing that we have tried this method in actually managing springs. So um, we serve El Paso and Tyler County, so we're in a few municipalities. And we tested, tested this workplace um, online platform. It is a product of Facebook, but it has nothing to do with Facebook, don't worry. It's a private group, um, and it's a, just a great way to have online dialogue, have all these handouts that you've gotten over the last couple months, and be able to ask questions and get answers. And this is a way that um, Kono is working with the city to be inclusive and to be open and transparent so that all of you can see the conversations, the documents, the process, and to keep staff accountable for um, what they're saying they're, they're going to do or pay for or what steps are next. So that being said, um, like I said, we're in partnership with um, the City of Colorado Springs to provide facilitation of this online group dialogue. So I'm going to be behind the computer and Ted, and we're going to say, hey, David, where is this document? Or what did the attorney say about this? So I'm going to have a ton of emails probably, but I'll explain a little bit more as I keep going. Um, we can help with the small and large group facilitation either online or in your own um, block or your neighborhood. Like David said, if you want to have um, this conversation in your living room and invite 10 neighbors over, we're happy to do that as well. Um, and stakeholder reach out and communication. Maybe there's some bigger players um, in the community that need to be involved. What's that? They need to have their email address or something. I'm yep, excited. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, so we will help with those three things. And then again, by participating in the workplace, um, we are not going to solicit you to be part of any newsletter or anything else. Um, your email address will be safe and only used for this online platform. Um, so what you will so what you will see will happen. So um, if you signed in today with your email address, or if you signed in in August for those that aren't here, um, you'll get an email from me probably Monday morning, and it'll have some steps on how to be part of this group. If you don't want to be part, email me back and say, take me off the list, and I will. I just want to kind of start with the foundation of everyone that's attended these meetings. So you'll receive an invitation for the next steps to log in. Once you have accepted the invitation, you will be part of the Briargate Neighbors Group. And you have access to all these documents, all the next meetings. Um, you can share this group with the next door. Let everybody and anybody know. Send me an email and I will get them logged into this platform. If you're interested, this is where I really need, before you leave tonight, you're going to go to that table over there and Ted is going to um, he's going to have a special sign-in sheet. I need a group of like 15 or so um, people that are part of this kind of task force that will feed us the information that you're hearing from your neighbors, that will help us secure meeting locations and say, this makes sense for us, that will maybe determine if door-to-door -door is the right method or maybe not the right method, that will help us get the signatures if we need the signatures, those 300 or 3,000. <laughs> um, that will help find solutions, that will kind of be the voice of the 10,000. Now, you're not speaking on behalf of, but you're informing us. And I say us as in David, Eric, me, and Ted, and the attorney. You will be kind of our, you'll, you'll be able to hear from us more often, and we'll hear from you more often um, to give us that feedback, feedback and constant input. So I need 15 volunteers if I can tonight, or tell your friends and family and see if they'll sign up. Um, so that we're going to call the SIB planning group or planning team. Uh, but again, it's just, to, you're not getting more special information than, than you are if you're not <laughs> in the special planning team. But it's just, we really need a kind of feet on the ground task force that's going to help really drive this forward and again, keep us accountable. So I know this is really, really hard to see, but this is kind of what the page looks like. It's pretty easy to follow, I promise. We've, like I said, we tested it with 150 residents in Manitou Springs, and they did okay. Um, there's ways to upload documents. There's ways to post. I have rules and guidelines on how to post, how to comment. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, again, I'm here to kind of coach you through that if there are questions. Um, 
those are the guidelines. I know they're long, but um, trust me, once you, once you get in there, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to understand. Um, so what I'm going to ask for you today, again, before you leave, is sign up with Ted for the special task force. But if you signed in already today, you're going to be automatically getting an email on Monday. Please accept the invitation by Wednesday. Just because we want to really move forward, we want to, we don't want there to be a gap from August to December next time. We want to be meeting with the overall neighborhood group probably quarterly, um, the task force probably monthly. Um, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we need to talk to the attorney and see what those next steps are. Um, again, there's my email. My name is Sarah Voss. It's svoss at csgovern.org. Email me if you want out. Email me if you have questions. Um, again, there's lots of great ideas that have been shared about this project by participating in this platform. We really feel like you'll have the opportunity to contribute to the conversation, access um, to updates, documents, and next steps. Um, if there are complaints and concerns, I just ask these ground rules still apply to the online dialogue. I don't want to kick anybody out, but we just want to make sure we have productive conversations. Um, and Dale, it sounds like you're HOA, maybe there's more questions. Um, you know, if there's other HOAs or neighborhood associations, let this group come to you or invite your group, have a representative online. Maybe you don't need all 200 residents on a workplace, but have a board member sign up. <laughs> Same for all of you. If you have a neighborhood watch, have your block captain, your leaders um, in your community sign up. Um, I think that's all I have, but we want more ideas, like you said, about how neighbors can get involved and volunteer. And I think this is just, this is just a start. This is just a communication tool to get more people plugged in. Um, follow Kono on Facebook if you'd like. We'll, um, we can do a shout out there. But we really want this to be targeted to this area and you guys live there. I don't live there, I live on the west side. But again, Kono is a neutral third party that's just really trying to wrap our arms around this to help facilitate the conversation. Do you have questions regarding the workplace? Are you a government entity or? No, we are not. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. We work with many local municipalities and receive some of our funding from local municipalities in order to do work that they can't do, but it's easier for us to do as a nonprofit. That makes sense. We're hopefully more trusted because we have no skin in the game. We're just here to just facilitate conversation. I'm not, I'm not going to be voting on this, and neither is my staff. So hopefully that helps. So where is this workplace hosted? Is it a it's a product of Facebook. So it is part of Facebook. But it's, it's not, you don't even log in your Facebook page. Nobody sees this. There's no news feed. It's literally it's a product, just like um, Adobe um, has products. You know, um, it's, a, it's a product. So we've tested it. It's free because we're a nonprofit. We can't afford it all these fancy things. But we actually manage several neighborhoods. But um, you will only be part of the bribery. You're not going to see Manitou's conversations, for example. Where does your ma uh, money come from? Um, we receive funding from corporate sponsors. So we have neighborhood associations and HOAs that are members. So there's a membership fee. We have foundations um, that we receive grants from, and then individual um, donors as well. And you can look at our website. I think it's laid out on the website for all those donors, too. Put yeah. this on next door also. What's that? Put this stuff we will put this on next door. Uh, basically what I'll put on next door is to email me for the invitation. Because you can't access this without an invitation from me. Because we don't want it to be just open to anybody that lives anywhere. So in order to access it, I'll kind of have this information to say, if you live in Briar Gate, and I can have a map and these boundaries for the SMD, please email Sarah as long as it's using the network to receive an invite to be on this platform. That's as simple as I can make it. You can put that on there just as a news item without yeah. having to sign up on next to us. You know, basically that, that's the thing they can offer. The city's monitoring it. I'm sorry, I don't The city is monitoring next door and they're also putting some of their uh, announcements on there. Yes. So we can target a, co a conversation in Briar Gates to have this post. But we work with the city on our posts as well. Okay. So we should we should be good. But all if you see something that you don't like, just let me know. We're we'll aware about this. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure.
sure I'm going to be up late at night with lots of comments. Uh, any other questions on that, please? If there's any other suggestions, if it doesn't work, I'm willing to try something else. So we're going to try this out, um, and, we'll try, and we'll use this platform to communicate when the next meeting is. Um, and then again, if we come to that meeting and everybody hates this, then we can try something else, and I'm willing to, to adjust in that way. So thank you for coming. Hang out. There's a, first of all, this, this, is, this is the most complicated um, legal neighborhood issue that the city is facing right now. So one of the things that I, I'd ask you guys to, to recognize is that this is an invitation to truly be a neighborhood. To try to figure out this is a problem we have in this neighborhood that needs to get addressed. I would encourage you, I'm going to try to help as best as I can. I'm on the out, outskirts of the neighborhood, but I'm going to be involved in this as well. Um, be neighborly about this. This is nobody's fault. So, so um, there are going to be issues, like you said, because we're talking about property, we're talking about our houses, we're talking about the biggest investment we have, and we're talking about money. So please, please, please be neighborly to one another. Um, there's one comment, and then I got one final, because there's a seventh rule we have today. Okay, I, I have one thing to say. So there are 2,200 2, uh, untaxed individuals within this district. Most of those 2,000 people do not know what it is being done here. There should be a collective effort to contact each one of those individuals, or each one of those parcels, so they can be fully aware of what's happening, and then if they don't have the input after that, then it doesn't matter what the folks say. But at least give them a chance. So be on the task force right. and come up with a plan. Okay. That, that is I heard from you. <laughs> I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we're not trying to hide this from anybody. We have we have representatives from the groups in yellow here today. They know about it. Everybody, you know. The, the, the ge geographies are we don't want to hide this from anybody and and, and 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 I would hope that the 50 people task force would figure out how the best way is to do this okay so 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 I thank you for for being on the task force. Signing up. Yes. <laughs> I'm in. remember to sign up at the table in the back if you're interested in coming up with that plan because you're right it's education we have to inform and I would hope everyone in the Tells their neighbors and try to the edition, and, and the, the guy, I, well, I think he probably had to go to get, I don't know. The fellow from the Woodman edition is here, uh, was here. We're going to get. I've got his information. I've got his info. I can get it out. Okay. We, we are, I, I'm going to be here to answer questions. Nobody has to go. We are late. Rule number seven tonight special is if you came and sat down, please at least take one chair and put it back over there so we can put it away. That's special rule number seven tonight. If you put more than one chair, I'll thank you tremendously. We'll cheer, we'll cheer for you, all right? Thank you for coming.